and amazing moderator, a brilliant scholar, and a genius by name, Father Dr. Cherian Karuka Parambil. Father Karuka Parambil was trained in philosophy and theology in St. Joseph's Interdiocesan Seminary, Mangalore. He studied Master of Theology in Orosthya Vidyapitam, the Oriental, the Pontifical Oriental Institute of Religious Studies, Kotayam, in 2002. Father Karuka Parambil completed his doctorate in theology in Paris, Lodon, Universidad, Salzburg in Austria. Father Karuka Parambil wrote an excellent thesis on identity, restoration, renewal, the Syro Malabar Church since Vatican II in the context of her hermeneutical task as a Catholic Eastern Church. Father Karuka Parambil wrote a number of excellent articles. Moreover, he also taught in Missionary Orient Orientation Center in Kotayam, Good Shepherd Major Seminary in Talasari, Amala Theological College in Changanesari. Father Karuka Parambil served as a priest in various parishes. Father was also served as an editor, joint secretary, and the director in the Department of Ecumenism. Father Karuka Parambil also attended a number of international conferences, especially the annual Vaishnava Christian Dialogue in Tirupati, Andhra Pradesh, India. Father Cherian Karuka Parambil, we are extremely delighted to have you with us. We are really fortunate to have you with us. Friends, let us all welcome Father Karuka Parambil to take over this webinar as a moderator. Over to you, Father Cherian. Thank you, uh, Reverend Sukumar, uh, for the welcome. And hearty welcome to all our dear friends from far and wide from India and abroad, uh, all those who are participating in this web webinar. And uh, today, we have an eminent scholar on Hinduism and also a great missionary of Ramakrishna Mission, His Excellency Swami Deyatmananda Ji. And he is introducing to us the great saint and mystic of Hinduism, Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, a 19th century religious leader and a reformer. And Swami Deyatmananda Ji, he will speak to us on the theme, Sri Ramakrishna and present world conflict. So uh, I am very grateful to Reverend Father Mathi Chandraganel for this opportunity uh, that I have to welcome and introduce, uh, welcome uh, Swamiji to our session. And before we go to the uh, session, uh, Reverend Sukumar will uh, introduce uh, Swamiji and uh, he will be uh, introducing the details regarding the uh, uh, personality and, and also uh, regarding the theme of uh, uh, Swamiji. Over to Reverend Sukumar. Thank you so much, Father Chirian. Let me introduce the most respected Swami Dayatmananda Swamiji. Swami Dayatmananda was born in 1943 in the state of Andhra Pradesh, India. Yanduro Mahan Bavalu Andarki Ma Vandanamalu, Marimukhimuga, Gauru Nivalena Swami Dayatmananda Ayagarki, Ma Swagatam Suswagatam. Swami Dayatmananda influenced by the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda. Swami joined the Ramakrishna order after finishing his college education in 1962. In fact, Swami Dayatmananda was ordained as a monk in 1973. He was working in various capacities in several centers of the order in India. His last center being Bangalore, where he served for 17 years. In 1991, he was posted to United Kingdom as Assistant Minister of Ramakrishna Vedanta Center. Swami Dayatmananda has taken charge of Ramakrishna Vedanta Center 
in United Kingdom, his special field of interest is Advaita Vedanta, the non-dualistic philosophy propagated by Shankaracharya as reinterpreted by Swami Vivekananda in our time. Now he is teaching in the Ramakrishna Mission Home of Service, Varanasi. We're very fortunate to have you, Swamiji. Now this is a time we're all waiting curiously to listen from you. The topic for this evening is Sri Ramakrishna and present world conflict. Over to you, Swamiji. Om Asatoma Satgamaya Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya Mrutyorma Amrutangamaya Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Lord, lead us from the non-being to being. Lead us from ignorance to right understanding. Lead us from suffering to bliss. Om Sarve Santu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Makaschit Dukkha Bhag Bhavet Om Shanti 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 May everyone be happy. I please wait a second. Let me. Uh, I'm not sure something is going on. I don't know why it is. Uh, echo is coming. I don't know how to. Huh? Okay, let me let me restart. Please wait for me. I don't know what's happening. Swamiji, so, yeah, if them are on in the same room, that was the reason why. If you have. Uh, at form, you can just put it uh, inside to one of the system. That should be all right. Uh, best let me start this one, please. Wait. Hey, and grateful to Father Matthew and all the brothers and sisters and friends. Today's topic is. Sri Ramakrishna and the present world conflict. Please bear with me for one second. I think there is something. Uh, are you able to hear me now properly? Clear, loud and clear, Swamiji. Very good. Sorry for the trouble. Okay. Millions of people today consider worship and to try to follow the teachings of Sri Krishna today. And for Hindus, there is a wonderful belief about incarnation of God. Whenever there is a need, God incarnates to give us right understanding about three things. I will come to that very shortly. The first part of my talk will be, when we look at the present day situation in the world, what do we see? What is the first thing that attracts our notice is conflict everywhere between every country practically threatening, trying to possess the lands of other people, etc. And there is national as well as international conflicts. Not only every nation is in conflict with the other nation, 
but within the nation itself no to human beings in the name of religion or party or a group seems to be able to cooperate to love and share with each other insatiable greed and lust advertised in the form of beauty form of dress cosmetic industry amply proves that we are all terribly enslaved by the worship of the physical body which means mainly two sex and money and power and this is what we see the next thing that we see is that we forgot the real truth about life as taught in the respective by the respective scriptures of each one of us and we are externalizing everything we have not developed the capacity to look within ourselves but only looking outside externalization we also see slavery to sense pleasures and what is the result of all this increasing mental disease mental health challenges exist frequently i am quoting from a mental health organization obtained from the internet mental health challenges exist frequently throughout the united states about 1 in 5 20% adults suffer from a diagnosable mental illness in any given year every day approximately 123 americans die by suicide and there is one death by suicide in the us alone every 12 minutes we are in the middle of a mental pandemic some people place this mental sickness taking into count all the other countries including india we about 30 more than 35% why because we are we have moved away we are moving away more and more from god to non god from inside to outside and what does it mean moving away from god to non god it means this is what i am quoting from eric from he used to call that we are slaves of possessions he wrote a marvelous book more than 40 years ago the title of which is to have or to be so we instead of being we are in the mode of having the more possessions the more power equated to more happiness to more peace of mind and this is called delusion and this is the root cause of all the situations that we see the beginning in vedantic scriptures hindu scriptures simply it is called adharma most of you i think all of you are familiar with the word dharma and adharma dharma means that which is absolutely right in every sense of the term and adharma represents its opposite i think we have moved away most of us to a great extent from dharma to adharma so the question million dollar question or 64 dollar question is can sri ram krishna's life and teachings help us the emphatic answer is yes so let me briefly recollect the life history highlighting the important points but before we can i go into the brief details of sri ram krishna's life i have to remind every hindu sage and saint he fulfills the four pillars of hinduism for many people hinduism looks as though it's the most complex religion in the whole world not so 
I can summarize that Hinduism is a building which stands firmly supported by four pillars. The first pillar, the concept of Brahman. Our ancient rishis, sages, wise people put one question. What is the truth? And what is truth? That which never changes. What is it that never changes? God. In other words, they prefer to give the name Brahman. So the concept of Brahman, that alone is the truth, that is infinite, and the whole world is coming, is an effect of that Brahman. So all of us, each one of us, are potential Brahmans, potential divinity. But for some mysterious reason, called Maya, we have forgotten our true nature. We mistake ourselves to be individuals consisting of body-mind complex, B and M complex. And until we know who we really are, and that is the aim of life, we cannot but suffer. And the second pillar is called knowing this truth that we are divine and manifesting it in our life through spiritual practice. And this is the second pillar, the concept of direct realization that each one of us is none other than divine. A third pillar is a very special pillar, Hinduism, based upon an ancient Vedic teaching, Ekam Sat Ipraha Bahuda Vadanti. Truth is one, God is one, reality is one, but different people, sages, choose to call it by various names and choose to approach that reality in the guise of various forms. Curiously, that we all differ, that God should have only this name, this forum. Otherwise, we are destined to go to the other place. But we do not differ in one concept about the qualities of God. He is all-powerful. He is everywhere. He is our father and mother. And he is looking after us. If we pray, surrender ourselves, then he will bestow his grace and he will uplift us and do whatever is necessary. And thereafter, we will forever be with him, in him, or become him. So this is the most wonderful third pillar. One can choose, must choose, to worship God in any form. That's why you get so many names, so many forms of God. So this is called the law of the chosen deity. A corollary of this is whenever the children of God, us, world, requires correction, right understanding, God is ready to incarnate. So God has incarnated, according to Hindus, many number of times, but he is going to incarnate every time, whenever it is necessary, as it is so popularly said, whenever dharma goes down and adharma is on the increase. So many people believe God incarnated once more in the 19th century and the name of that incarnation is Sri Ramakrishna. But it doesn't matter whether we accept Sri Ramakrishna as an incarnation or not, but one of the main functions of an incarnation of God is to reinterpret scriptures according to the changing circumstances. The values are eternal. They cannot be changed, but their practical application in day-to-day -day life has to be changed according to the changing circumstances. For that, scriptures have to be rightly reinterpreted. That's what actually Jesus had done, Buddha had done, Rama had done, Krishna had done. That's what Sri Ramakrishna had done. 
and his disciple, about whom I am going to speak, has done at the Parliament of Religions and thereafter also. This is the third pillar of Hinduism, the law of the chosen deity. That means each one of us have the right and we must exercise, we must choose that aspect of God, that form of God with that particular name which we can love, adore, worship and try to approach him. And the concept of many incarnations of God. The fourth law, well known to everybody, the law of karma. We are the makers, creators of our own destiny through our actions, what we did and the corollary of this law of karma is Hindu believes many past lives. What it means is God gives us any number of opportunities until we return to him and be with him and become one with him. This is the concept. This is the fourth pillar and a whole of modern science, a whole of the science is totally dependent upon this, the cause the law of the cause and the effect. Science is nothing but proper study of the law of cause and effect. That's how we are able to guide satellites, rockets, etc., progress in any field of life and obtain better knowledge. These are the four pillars. Anyone who understands these four pillars I am restating them. Brahman, the one God, one reality, one truth. Realization of that Brahman, that we are all that same reality. And the law of chosen deity, worship God in any form one likes. And each one of us must love God only in our own way. No law, no scripture. No tradition should ever put a bar. Each one of us are free. And that is the third pillar of Hinduism. And the fourth pillar is the law of karma and the belief in past as well as future reincarnations. If anyone understands these four pillars, they have understood thoroughly in what Hinduism is. This is the essence of all the Vedas, all the Upanishads, all the Bhagavad Gita and every other scripture and the teachings of every Hindu sage and saint that was in the past, in the present, also in the future. And Sri Ram Krishna has not come to destroy, but he has come to make it clear. Very briefly, I want to talk about Sri Ram Krishna. Ram Krishna was born in February 1836 in a small village in West Bengal. He was born into a very poor but very pious, very truthful, orthodox Bengali Brahmin family. His whole family was worshippers of God in the form of Rama, Rama Bhaktas, devotees of Rama. And his father and his elder brother's family wanted him to be educated. But Sri Ram Krishna, from the very early, refused to enter into this, what we call academic education. And he said, the only true education is that which takes us to God, makes us realize the truth, and makes us be what we really are. This is called Paravidya, Supreme Knowledge, that alone deserves the name of education. Everything else is not worthless, but if it doesn't help, it's inimical and obstructive to being peaceful, to be happy, and to manifest our potentialities. At the age of around 20, because of poverty, he was brought to Calcutta by his eldest brother. And there was a rich lady called Rani Rasmani. 
she built a temple all by divine will and when the temple was ready no brahmin was ready to act as a priest as a worshipper because she was of a lowly caste ram krishna's eldest brother gave the opinion that provided she manages it in the name of a brahmana any brahmana should have no objection to act as a priest and even then nobody was ready but ram kumar was his name he was asked do you believe do you believe in what you express he said yes then come and do the puja the maintenance the opening of the temple and continue the worship of the god in the form of divine mother kali by the way hinduism is one of the religions few religions which also worships god and emphatically so god to think of god in the form of the most loving mother and as many of you know by she goes by the name of lakshmi saraswati parvati durga kali innumerable names are there i will not go into the details this temple belong to that deity called kali and after some time the eldest brother of sri ram krishna passed away and sri ram krishna at first was not willing to accept the post of the priest but fate decreed that he should accept as soon as he entered into the priesthood he started questioning and said am i worshiping an image a stone idol or is god really present here if god exists there is only one proof to prove that he really exists one must come into contact directly one must have a first hand experience of god that alone can be the real proof so he earnestly did what he thought should be done and what is that that he should become pure he should remove all the worldly attachments totally be devoted to god only desire god and nothing else in his bucket list there is only one desire i want god and only god and nothing else so that's what had happened and he very succeeded without any guidance this is a speciality of sri ram krishna and i will tell you why also sri ram krishna earnestly prayed oh mother i do not have any teacher i do not know what is right wrong you please teach me oh mother and his earnest prayer heartfelt prayer brought down an intuitive understanding sometimes expressed as he used to see mother god in the form of the mother and guide him earnestly do this first do that why did you do that that is not right so through intense yearning for god realization he succeeded in having a direct vision of god in the form of pure consciousness two points i want to highlight in this regard first of all our concept of god and a realized soul's concept of god are totally different we usually think god as a human being but that's not true first of all it is okay to start our spiritual practice to focus our mind so that we can adore and worship the form of jesus the form of buddha the form of krishna rama our divine mother but in course of time all these will fall down by the way and pure consciousness alone which the zen buddhism very emphatically highlights that is pure consciousness i am pure consciousness i am nothing but pure consciousness and there is no 
division between my consciousness and the almighty infinite consciousness, not even a part, not even a small bit, but is exactly one and the same. That was how Ramakrishna had the vision. That is the first point. God has pure existence, pure knowledge, and pure consciousness. Of course, I am aware of the passing time, so I have to uh, hurry up. But these are very profound points. We have to listen and take it in, ponder, try to understand whether you are a Christian, a Buddhist, a Hindu, a non-believer, it doesn't really matter. Any earnest seeker of truth should be able to understand this. There is not much mystery about it. Second point is that if someone is in earnest to progress in spiritual life and to realize God, I'm using that word God, some people don't like that word God, Notoriously, some people call him the ground of being, or Paul Village used to call him. Some people call him the nameless and the formless, the pointless, the unmentionable, indescribable. Doesn't matter. For simplification, I'm using the word God as pure consciousness. If someone is earnest, and that earnestness, Intense yearning is sufficient. Inner understanding will come by the grace of God. And even if there were to be no external aids or teachers, one can realize God. That is proved succinctly by the Ramakrishna. So these are the two points. God has pure consciousness and God listens to the prayers. And even if there is no guiding, guidance, one can realize him. Second time, Hiram Krishna had to go through the same process, but this time, he wanted to follow the traditional path of accepting a teacher and following a well-trodden path, a well-known path. Hinduism can be broadly divided into four yogas. The path of the Karma Yoga, path of the devotional path and the path of the pure meditation, concentration and meditation and the path of discrimination called Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Raja Yoga and Gnana Yoga. And Sri Ramakrishna had more or less followed all these paths represented by Puranas, mythologies, followed by, taught by Tantras, a distinct branch of Hindu scriptures glorifying the divine motherly aspect of God and Vedas, for which Shankaracharya and his followers of Advaita are very famous. In South India, most people, the followers of Madhva, the followers of Ramanuja, follow the path of bhakti. Sri Ramakrishna followed the path of bhakti, the path of meditation, the path of karma yoga, and the path of nana yoga under competent teachers and realized God, the same God, the one God, proving the ancient Rigvedic dictum. God is one, the truth is one, but sages call it by various paths. The implications are every religion, every path of yoga, provided a person is earnest, he, can, he will reach only one God. For the simple reason, there is only one truth, one reality. There are not many gods. There are not even two gods. So we have to earnestly accept this truth. A Hindu, a Christian, a Buddhist, even if they do not assert the name of God, the concept of God, or any other for a Muslim, all are calling and the only one God, but with different names, different forms, different qualities. 
by the way buddha was not a non believer in god but he was aiming at the what is called nameless formless qualityless concept of god so sri ram krishna had realized that every path provided one a sincere and earnest and ready to pay the price will reach the same goal but we are living in the 20th century 21st century it's not enough to obtain realization from the context of one's own religion otherwise we are all living a multi religious multi cultural multi linguistic multi political multi cultural society if we do not have sympathy understanding of the other culture other language other religion there is to be bound inevitable conflicts and at least we can prevent by right understanding so this is what is called in the modern times phenomenological phenomenological view of seeing other religions what it means is one must stand in the shoes of the other religious follower see the beliefs the concepts the practices from the view point of that particular follower and without that conflicts are inevitable and this view phenomenological point of view is gradually gaining ground and this particular meeting interfaith meeting is one of its expressions so sri ram krishna realized god without any external aid purely through intense learning he realized to god in the all aspects of hinduism the bhakti the yoga the karma and the knowledge aspect he also really followed tantras vedas he became a monk though he was married and then to prove that spirituality is not the exclusive claim of any monk or nun but each one of us our children of divinity we can realize even in the secular life that division between sacred and secular is one of the greatest barriers in progress religions have oppressed and had bloodied the world it is the greatest amount of killings murdering oppression etc all in the name of god hopefully these series of lectures will give us better understanding about that religion is here to help each one of us wherever we are and make us help us to become a better person by helping us to unfold to manifest each one's potentiality through any field of life it could be art it could be science it could be administration it could be a householder's life it could be a monk's life it could be a life of a single unmarried person or it could be a widowed person divorced person it doesn't matter because the only truth and one and only truth is we are all children of divinity so for some time he also put himself in the shoes of a christian in the shoes of a muslim and re- reached the same realization of one god one realization probably some or many of the followers of other religions are not ready to accept sri ramakrishna's this particular view that every religion is a pathway to god this was what in brief sri ramakrishna had through his whole life he realized and then he spent his whole life he passed away on 16th august 1886 he lived on this earth only for 6 months past 50 years and 
he realized God at the age of about 35 or so. And thereafter, he devoted his life, rest of his life, to propagate these grand truths, which go beyond the boundaries of any race, religion, culture, etc. Now, I will summarize what exactly Sri Ramakrishna had taught us, main teachings of Sri Ramakrishna. First, incontrovertibly, he realized God and asserted, asserted that God exists. It's not a theory. He came face to face with God, not like Moses comes to face to face with God in the burning bush, but like Jesus who says, I and my father are one. God exists. God is one, but he is called by various names. Everyone, without exception, is calling upon the same one God, not with various names, various forms, but all conflicts lie in the matter of names and forms only. But everyone thinks of God exactly in his qualities, all merciful, all compassionate, all loving, all sharing and all taking care of us. We are all children of God because if we accept God created this world, God cannot create from a material like a potter or a carpenter creates furniture out of wood, a potter creates a pot out of clay, a goldsmith creates ornaments out of gold, but from himself because he is everything. So, we are all potentially divine. We are all children of God, hence of the same nature as God. So, each soul is potentially divine. Each one of us potential Buddha, potential Christ, etc. So, what should be the goal of life? Each one of us must manifest our true nature because our true nature is divine. And until we realize who we really are, we have to be born again and again in this world. So, many incarnations are but opportunities given us to climb that spiritual ladder, ultimately culminating in oneness with God. Hence, the realization of God is the only goal of life. There are millions of ways to reach God. Not only a few religions that we know, a cobbler, there are many stories. I am tempted to tell you, but for lack of time, I will not tell. A cobbler who hardly knew how to pray with the help of some alphabet, one day forgot to bring the alphabet. And he told God, God, you know I cannot read. So I will just read one by one, A, B, C, D. And you arrange the prayer. God turned to Archangel Gabriel. And he said, this is the greatest prayer I had ever heard in my life. So God realization is the only goal of life. But there are millions of ways. That means every person, so understanding is the way to him, to God. Ultimately, all paths lead to the same God. Life is an opportunity and it will be given to us again and again to manifest our potential divinity. And if we fail to grow spiritually, we need our despair. We have to suffer, but opportunity will be given to us. If we can understand these main teachings of Sri Ramakrishna, they can help us in the present world, which is full of restlessness, peace, even though our knowledge of science, technology is increasing rocket-like. Explosion of knowledge leading to more conflicts, etc. 
Now, can we take the life and teachings of Sri Ramakrishna? So here are very brief points only. Life is full of problems. There is only one solution to all problems of them. Every problem of turn towards God. So turn from outside to inside. Spiritualize every day life. And every religion is a distinct way to progress in life. And by the way, it doesn't mean that religion is the only way. Whatever we have to alter the very definition of religion. It's not Christianity, not Hinduism, not Buddhism, not Vedanta, but whatever takes us to God, that's religion, that's yoga. So these are the main things. How does it apply to the present day world? Ram Krishna has taught us. Turn from outside to inside. Unless we practice spirituality, we purge of our selfishness, greed, lust for sex, money. They are not bad, but they should be used to enrich life not to enslave us. Spiritual experience must be the basis of true understanding, religious or societal or otherwise, and not mere tolerance or social necessity. I mentioned earlier that harmony of religions, the implication of Sri Ramakrishna's practice of different religions for the modern man very briefly stated that it has shown the modern man the right approach to other religions, showing reverence to other religions or other prophets or even practicing other religious paths does not mean disowning one's own religion, not deserting one's own religion, but to learn lessons. What lessons? There must be two lessons. What is it? Every religion has defects. There is no religion which has no defects, no deficiencies. We can learn from others. So what can, what can Hinduism learn, for example, from Islam, brotherhood, unity? What can Hinduism learn from Buddhism? Meditation, compassion. What can Hinduism learn from Christianity? Service with wholehearted love and caring and sharing from Christianity. This is the special contribution. What can Christianity learn? The mysticism, the inward life. Not that it is lacking. The desert fathers amply show the mystic side of life. The Greek Orthodox Church. Similarly, in Russia, the Greek Russian Orthodox Church, from which came the greatest teachings, Philokalia, amply show us how we have to turn our mind more towards God and integrate our external life with that. This is one aspect. Let us remove the deficiencies which every religion definitely has. If anybody claims that one religion is perfect, either he's a fool or he's an ignorant person. Second, every religion has got hidden truths. Only when we study other religions, we come to appreciate the greatness of our own religions. I'll just tell you very briefly a small Jewish story. There was a poor rabbi. He wanted money. He prayed to God. One night he had a dream. Go to such and such a bridge and dig underneath the bridge, such and such a corner, and there is treasure there. And the poor rabbi traveled there, started digging, but there was a soldier guarding the bridge. He asked him, a fool, what are you doing here? And the rabbi, simple, simple man, he told, I'm poor, I had a dream, 
And the soldier laughed and said, should a old person like you not be wiser? Should you believe all these stupid dreams? Look, for example, yesterday night I dreamt in such and such a village, in the house of such and such a person, beneath his kitchen hearth, there is a great treasure hidden. And the rabbi, as soon as he heard, he understood that he, the soldier's dream was redirecting him to his own home and he rushes and digs under his heart and gets sufficient amount of treasure to lead a happy life. What is the moral of this parable? That every religion contains deep hidden truths, but sometimes we have to go to other places, other people, other events to learn the lesson that what we are seeking is right at home. That's why the interrelation between one religion and the other religion is absolutely important. Then modern psychologists, modern thinkers like Joseph Royes, Viktor Frankl, and Jung, many others have shown that the characteristic feature of humanity is search for meaning, especially Viktor Frankl in a Nazi camp. He himself suffered and he had understood that life is meant to have meaning. And meaning comes only when one knows what one really is, which in Hindu's paraphrase, thou art that supreme reality, tattvam asi. And life has become meaningless in the present day world. And that's what Sri Ramakrishna through his life wants to highlight that spiritual life alone is the highest life and it integrates both secular and spiritual life, outside and inner life, in every field of life and that alone can give meaning to life. Otherwise, life is meaningless. Most of people's spiritual maladies, mental sickness, even physical sickness is this lack of meaning in life. So we are all seeking that meaning in life. And Sri Ramakrishna's life crystal clearly highlights the ways and means of what is man, what is the meaning of life, and how to reach it. So to just briefly, I want to summarize what I have spoken today. God exists. We are all potential gods. Life is given to us for one and only purpose, to manifest our potential divinity, striving to manifest our potential divinity is called spiritual life. And each one of us must strive to be spiritual and that alone can make life meaningful, fruitful and fill us with bliss. It doesn't mean all of us have to turn into monks or nuns. It means we can enjoy the world if we have a spiritual attitude and lead our life in accordance to the direction given by our respective scriptures and teachers. So this is the lesson from Sri Ramakrishna. Not only Sri Ramakrishna, if we understand our scriptures, is the lessons of Jesus Christ, Prophet Muhammad, and other sages and saints. This is the only way to be at peace ourselves and also help bring the same peace in our neighbors, in other countries, and the whole world, including the living and non-living. This is what the modern thinkers call it. Holistic attitude is included in the spiritual attitude, spiritual life. This is how I believe Ram Krishna can help us. It doesn't matter whether you believe him as an incarnation, as a saint, as a wise person, 
but his life and teachings can enrich each one of us in some respects and help us move forward. May the Divine Lord bless us all with love, peace and greater understanding and cooperation. Om Shantihi 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 Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Thank you all. Thank you, uh, Swamiji, for your uh, scholarly, uh, clear, and simple uh, way of uh, presentation, presenting the great personality of uh, Sri Ramakrishna and also the, the theme, Sri Ramakrishna and present world conflict. Uh, and as we are participating in this uh, series of web, uh, webinar lectures uh, conducted by Ecumenical Christian Center Bangalore, and uh, Sri Ramakrishna Mission Office for Ecumenism and Dialogue of Catholic Bishops Conference of India and the Focular Movement. Uh, this uh, organization uh, jointly conducting this uh, webinar series and we are on the second uh, week of our uh, session and we are very happy to have as an introducing lecture uh, of uh, Swamiji, Swami Deyatmananda Ji, uh, Deyatmananda, and uh, uh, the very clear and present way of uh, presentation of the present situation, present day conflict of uh, uh, the, in the world of different nature, and how we are uh, moving away from, the, from God to non-God, from being to having and from dharma to adharma, in this context, what is the uh, importance of the teaching of uh, Ramakrishna, uh, Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa? And there also he has uh, taken us through the, uh, I mean, the, the different understanding of Hinduism to the teaching of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. Thank you, Swamiji, uh, for your uh, presentation. And what we have understand uh, that how Sri Ramakrishna uh, looked towards this uh, uh, understanding of the Supreme Being, God in the form of loving mother and also the pure consciousness and uh, uh, how to say that uh, it is the understanding is uh, universal that is going beyond the barriers of religion, race and nas nation and nationalism and, and it is uh, it cannot be uh, we cannot limit the understanding or the realization of the Supreme Being. And uh, again, uh, he has concluded uh, saying, uh, bringing us to the understanding of uh, or the teaching of Sri Ramakrishna or the realization of Sri Ramakrishna uh, regarding the Supreme Being or the realization of the Brahman. And we are very thankful to you for this uh, 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 understanding that uh, you have presented to us and taking us to the real understanding of uh, the nature of God, the, the Supreme Consciousness as understood by Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. And now, dear friends, uh, we have the opportunity to, to ask questions or clarifications from uh, uh, Swamiji. And uh, uh, and also, you are. Uh, if you have anything to share and uh, and uh, to us, uh, an addition to uh, what was what Swamiji told, and present, uh, especially the the, uh, I mean, on the talk or the understanding of uh, Sri Ramakrishna and the present world conflict as presented by Swamiji. And if you have anything to ask, please be free to ask. We have. Uh, around uh, 20 minutes to speak, uh, to give and take, and uh, please. Anybody want? Oh. Yeah, I am in darkness now, but uh, you will come in. Uh, if anybody has to, wants to ask, please raise your hands and please ask. Or Hello. I, yeah, please, please. 
Hello. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Samiji, for your uh, very vivid presentation. It is very clear to all of us. And uh, you have very clearly explained, which uh, I did not know about the four pillars of uh, uh, Hinduism. And also uh, how, whether, it, uh, whether we are a nun or a uh, lay person, we can be spiritual. So it is, uh, thank you so much for that. And uh, I have a question that is not uh, that you have, when you spoke about the third pillar, you said about the incarnation. And yes. uh, now, the, now, uh, now the present situation, the COVID-19 situation, all of us are facing in a very worse situation, the world itself. So uh, uh, do you think that uh, at present uh, God can incarnate once again uh, whenever Dharma goes down? I feel that uh, the world is facing because of that the dharma goes down. Uh, do you think that God can incarnate now in the present situation? Thank you for the nice question. My answer is that there is no need for God to reincarnate again because only in the 19th century we believe God had incarnated. But let me first clarify, we use these words, Acharya, incarnation, realized soul. It's very important concept is, how do we know who is an incarnation and who is not? Here is the way to understand. If one person has seen God, experienced God, an incarnation of God also experienced God. Is there any difference in their experience? No. If we drink water, one drop from any part of any river, our experience of the water is exactly the same. Then what is this concept of incarnation? There are millions of saints. They have all experienced God. That's why we call them saints. But knowledge-wise, they're all same. They know God, but power. Every saint doesn't have exactly the same amount of power. That's where an Acharya, according to Hinduism, for example, Saint Paul, Shankaracharya, etc., are disciples of Buddha. A tremendous power, same knowledge, but God has endowed them tremendous power. But the incarnation of God is one. Across centuries, millenniums, he influences people. For example, Buddha is influencing people today in millions. Christ is influencing people in millions. Rama, Krishna, Chaitanya, Ramakrishna. He who can influence greater number of people for a longer period of time has a very special power. And in whom such power is manifest, he is called an incarnation of God. Why did I tell you all these things? Because many of us have very poor understanding the difference between a realized soul, an acharya, and an incarnation of God. Okay, now to talk about Sri Ramakrishna had come just now in a very short time. I tried to outline and highlight the important events in his life, as well as his most important teachings. So long as those teachings are clear, and so long as those events can inspire us in our life and transform our life into a better being, better persons, we do not need another incarnation of God. And by the way, 
An incarnation of God doesn't come every hundred years, every year. Many people claim their incarnations of God. Many people preach their own teachers as the greatest incarnation of God. Anyway, we do not accept it. But Buddha, Christ, Ramakrishna, Ramakrishna are still influencing millions and millions of Prophet Muhammad. How many people is inspiring even today? So, there is no need. I do not believe that God is going to incarnate. He is already incarnated. He gave out his teachings. He led the most marvelous life for us to imitate. We must take cognizance of his life. This is called imitation of Christ, imitation of Ramakrishna and take his teachings in the broadest light, exercising our rationality, the power of thinking, come to definite conclusions and transform our life. So Amen. this is a brief answer. We have the guidance, we have the inspiration, we have the pathway crystal clearly shown to us. Now let us transform our life by understanding these things. Thank you for the nice question. Thank you, thank you Swami, for thank your you, vivid clarification. For answer and so, thank you, Minimal, for the question. Swamiji, I have a, a little suggestion. If, if probably you can answer after two, three questions together, if it is better. Or, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, very, we have, very good suggestion. Yes. We have two Why in line. Yes, yeah. provided they, they belong to the same category of well, yeah. okay. question. Yes. Please, uh, yes. Miss Caroline, Caroline, you can. Uh... Yes, you can hear me. Please. Yeah. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you for um, what you told us about Sri Ramakrishna. Maybe because we are experiencing so much suffering in this moment. Mm, I was wondering what was the approach of this Hindu saint to suffering? Like, uh, what were his teachings when faced with suffering? Did he yeah. experience suffering also? Okay. And we have uh, uh, Kerlin, Sherline Menezes. No, uh, please, you can also put the question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Swamiji, for your wonderful lesson. Uh, just two points, if you can, um, if there is time for you to, to highlight it a bit more. I was happy to hear about the phenomenological point of view that many religions, the fact that, uh, uh, that it's becoming very popular, this approach yes. of putting ourselves in the shoes of the other to understand uh, the religion from that perspective. Uh, yes. To what extent is that really possible? Because you later spoke about uh, Sri Ramakrishna in some way having this sort of experience. So uh, to what extent is that really possible considering also a, a worldview of, uh, of every religion? So that was the oh. one point. And the other, uh, very briefly, you had also mentioned uh, that no scripture should come in the way of our love for God. That was also very uh, a very beautiful statement. But if you can elaborate on these two points a bit, thank you. Yes. Yeah. So <clears throat> I will deal with these two questions now. What can we do, or what can what light Sri Ramakrishna can throw at our present condition of suffering? My understanding is very clear. Hinduism always emphasized that God is compassionate, loving. He doesn't create any suffering. It is we, each individual, it is our karma. This is the fourth pillar of Hinduism, the law of karma. So I can only tell what I understand. This COVID situation, it is one of the most unique type of situation it has affected people, rich and poor, young and old, irrespective of religion, race, culture, or any societal views, believers, non-believers, it doesn't really matter. The question we have to put ourselves is, who created it? 
It is only foolish human beings who have created it. Now here is something very profound according to me. We tend to believe a few individuals only have done it. I completely disagree with that view. After all, a government is nothing but the collective representation of all of us. If, for example, a country is trying to possess other people's properties, grab their lands, it is not one single person. The moment we think that here is one person, if that person can be eliminated, everything will be heaven. That is a very naive view, according to me. That person is nothing but a collective representation of the entire nation. That's where the law of karma affects not only individually, but collectively. The people whom we elect shows what type of mentality we have. So if a large number of people determine to lead a decent life, a life of what we call dharma or righteousness, at least if not to be totally unselfish, but live and let live. If we can do it, a great change can be brought about. Okay, there is something very curious. Every government is trying to advise people, put on masks, try to be careful, keep a distance. But I find everywhere people are defying these things and trying to think that ancient truth, proving, trying to prove that ancient truth, everybody thinks that suffering comes to the other fellow, but not to me. As the most wonder, wonder, greatest wonder in the world. We are all have collective responsibility, collective way of behaving properly, and God has given us that brain to understand this. If we can do our level best, then the present situation can be improved, tolerated. But one thing also, I'm taking time, but please bear with me. If anyone of us thinks that this is the final straw and nothing further, no greater suffering is ever going to come to us. Perhaps, I use perhaps because I am convinced. But as philosophers always say, I believe, I have faith that who knows, tomorrow some madcap can also give terrible amount of even deadly, dangerous viruses can spread. This biological warfare is truly frightening. But from a spiritual viewpoint, we don't get anything we don't deserve. If we are getting anything, that means we deserve it. What is the way? Let us transform our life. Let us become spiritual. Let us try to observe all the best rules and regulations of health, cooperation, trying to help each other, etc. This is my brief answer to the first question. Second question will be, we are all having interfaith meetings and unless a person belonging to any particular faith is 100% sincere, this should not be, this kind of meeting should not be merely an eye wash. They should not be because this is the fashion to have interfaith meetings. But a sincere belief, if we believe in God, God created all of us. And if God created all of us, he has given us that right understanding. Our languages are not same. Our diet is not the same. Our dress is not the same. So in so many ways we differ and variety is the spice of life, but unity in diversity is the goal of life. So sincerely we have to feel, how can I understand my brother who seems to me to be treading a different pathway like. So that would be my answer to this phenomenological view that 
That is why Sri Ramakrishna had put himself in the shoes of a Christian. For three days he prayed and he had a vision of Christ in case you don't know this fact. And Christ entered into himself. And similarly, Prophet Muhammad, he had a vision of Prophet Muhammad. But it is also said in the life of Sri Ramakrishna, Sri Ramakrishna later on expressed the difference between Hinduism and Islam is so great, whatever be the reason, that it will take long time for them to have a mutual understanding. At least for the sake of peace, we must keep faithful to our own inherent beliefs, try to be as sincere as possible, and respect every religion, every other aspect of God, every saint belonging to every religion, and every scripture must be respected. And that is where I'm, I was deeply troubled when this France, supposed to be one of the uh, very pivot of modern cultural institute, says in the name of religion, we can do whatever we like. Such a terribly ignorant, foolish, dangerous view to be held by almost entire nation, represented by the Prime Minister of France. I cannot believe in this 21st century, anybody can make such a statement. Billions of people today follow Islam, and there are many saints, especially Sufi saints, who represent the mystical side of Islam. And they are saints. There is no difference between, there is no Hindu saint, Christian saint, Muslim saint, Jewish saint. Saints are saints. The men of God. To say that we will ridicule a prophet who, has, who is inspiring, who is, who is bringing so much of reverence among billions of people commanding that reverence today, all in the name of stupid freedom, is unbelievable by us. And I was even more shocked to find out that very few protests have been made and I don't condole violence, but these nations must be taught a great lesson. That, but so I will just give you that phenomenological view is the only way out. And it is growing in a very sincere person that we must place ourselves, experience, life, beliefs of that particular person. Then only we can have hearty, real sympathy, rational sympathy, there is no other way that is possible. Uh, I think I forgot the third question. Could you kindly repeat it? What is that? Uh, no, you had, um, you had just made a statement saying that uh, scripture should not come in, in the way of our love for God. Yes. I will tell you something very interesting. Sri Ramakrishna's view and Vedic view, Hindu scriptures, the highest scriptures revered by Hinduism are called Vedas. Veda means by definition, that knowledge which we can never obtain through our five sense organs, all scientific, artistic, uh, knowledge, etc. But supernatural, supersensory knowledge can be got only through intuition not through reasoning, can be got only from the scriptures. What is a scripture? It is the expression of the experience of a realized soul. So these scriptures are blindly followed by many people. And so um, there are many ugly phenomena taking place in the name of the scripture. What I mean to say, if any scripture or rather, I would say this, any wrong interpretation of the scripture. I will elaborate very briefly about this subject. Any scripture can never be wrong. And I am forced to tell you something very important. Let me take, for example, Veda. 
99% of the writings in the Veda, which has been put in writing later on, teachings of the Veda, have nothing to do with super sensory knowledge. Only that which it talks about God, whether there is afterlife, whether there is afterworld, alone is scriptural knowledge. The rest is its practical applications in our day-to-day -day life. So to claim that every word written in a scripture is gospel truth, is coming directly from, as if, you know, I just am making a little bit of fun. Old Testament, begat, 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 Abraham begat, and David begat, and page after page, somebody asked me, why does this, oh, God has infinite time, so he wants to pass his time, so he's filling up his time after begat, begat. I hope I'm making sense. Is only that truth which it talks about, about God, after life, after world, alone deserves to be called Veda or scripture. The rest is illustration, practical application. So any scripture contains these three questions, answers to three questions. Who am I? What is the goal of life? And what is the way to reach the goal of life? In Sanskrit, beautiful definitions are there. Tattva, what is the truth? Purushartha, what is the goal of human life? Pita, what is the pathway to reach identity? God is the truth, Brahman is the truth. All of life is to manifest our potential divinity and become divine. And any path sincerely believed and practiced will lead us to the same goal. Because sincerity cannot sustain wrongness, illogicity for a long time. Okay, so now I am coming to interpret the scriptures in the right way is the task of any incarnation, any prophet. If any religion fails to produce wise people who have to reinterpret scripture, not changing their eternal values, but their application for day-to-day -day life according to the changed circumstances, eternal values for a changing society, that religion remains barren like a tree, a mango tree, fully grown, lush with leaves, branches, but doesn't produce a single fruit. The fruit of religion is the production of spiritual people and the ripe fruit is the production of a saint. Any religion which fails to produce a saint will be more dead tree, living, not living. Living tree must produce fruits. So this right interpretation, every incarnation comes to establish dharma. How does he do it? By reinterpreting the scriptures. But if anybody clings, this is what my God or my saint had told 5,000 years back, 1,500 years back, and I will cling to it. I will not allow anybody to change it, to interpret otherwise. Such a person, not only damaging himself or herself, but trying to do injustice to his or her own religion, to other human beings. This is what I meant, that every passage in the scripture should be understood rightly according to the changing circumstances, not only according to the changed circumstances, according to the stage of one's growth. A child must be interpreted, same truth in one way, and a grown-up young man, right, full age, full vigor of youth must be interpreted in another way, a semi-retired person at the age of 60 or so must be interpreted another way. An old man must be interpreted another way. A householder, a monk, a what is called living a retired life must be interpreted in a different way. If we fail to interpret and cling on to one meaning only, then throw out that scripture 
and try to understand properly. And that's where Sri Ramakrishna has thrown a mass of light. How to understand? How to understand? Four characteristics. A spiritual person is always happy. He loves everybody equally. He is, treats everybody equally. And he is ready to sacrifice his life if he can help anybody. If these four characteristics, maybe in small measures, can be manifest in anybody's life, we can certify that person, man or woman, is progressing in life. If not, there is some problem, either misunderstanding, wrong application, or whatever it is. That is the answer to this third question. So thank you, Swamiji. Uh, dear friends, as, uh, I must uh, ask pardon to all of you, those who have so many questions and uh, I mean, uh, to know many things more, but we, will po we, have, we may have to postpone it for the next session. And now I, uh, as we are uh, reaching the time, I ask the intervention of the director and, uh, and uh, Minlun also uh, to, to conclude the session, please. Um, <clears throat> Thank you, uh, uh, Swamiji. Uh, yes. Mananda. Unfortunately, I could not uh, see the uh, the uh, my video is not working very well. So oh. therefore, um, I am just on the audio. Um, yeah. So I must thank you um, from the bottom of my heart for this wonderful uh, lecture, uh, expressing what is um, who is uh, Sri Ramakrishna and what is his relevance and how he has uh, reformulated uh, the, the Vedas, reinterpreted it, and then um, how he influenced the whole of India and also the, uh, the, the different places um, all over the world and how he has groomed uh, um, Narendra to uh, Sri Vivekananda and the Ramakrishna mission who has established. So it is so far, uh, uh, fortunate to uh, hear from you. Um, I was also uh, in the Dakshineshwar temple and what, oh. what fascinated me was there I found huh. that, you know, the picture of Mother Mary with huh. Jesus inside uh, his room. Yes. Uh, I was told that, you know, uh, he was uh, living in that room and uh, it was so fascinating. Uh, to see that you know that uh, mother mary with uh, the, the child the child is sleeping on uh, her uh, shoulders that was yes, so yes, fascinating yes, yes. Um, and then uh, again i have seen i have lived also in the sri ramakrishna mission in kerala purnatagara for almost two weeks and i found that in the temple uh, yes. jesus praying um, in gethsemane that uh, yes, I, yes, I, yes. I was told that uh, that picture is in all the temples and then in uh, during Christmas time, you also wash uh, the feet of each other uh, as a kind of a commemoration. Yeah. So I have been uh, influenced by Swamiji's like Swami um, uh, Maitreya and then many, many others, uh, Maitrananda who was in... Uh, Purnatagara. So uh, yes, thank you uh, uh, very much. And then we are also looking forward to the, the next um, lecture of yours on Sri Vivekananda. Swami so Vivekananda. Yeah, yeah, Swami Vivekananda. So uh, friends, the, the question uh, will be uh, for today's lecture will be, what is the meaning of uh, life? And uh, what is the concept of God? according to Sri Ramakrishna. So the question uh, will be, what is the concept of God and the meaning of life according to Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa? So the question will be sent uh, to the WhatsApp group. So maybe uh, Milun, you can uh, speak about uh, the next Thursday's program. Yes, friends, as I have uh, put on the screen, our next lecture will be on the 20th May and timing will be the same time, 6 p.m. The topic is Saint Kuriakos alias Chavra, 
a global transformational leader to be presented by Reverend Dr. Thomas Satam Parampil, CMI, the Private General of the Carmelites of Mary Immaculate Congregations. So as Father had announced, the question will be put up on the uh, WhatsApp group as well as we will mail it to you tomorrow. And please write the assignment and give your reflections and send it back to us uh, before next week, Thursday. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was thank very, you. very thank meaningful. You. Any information thank about the previous assignments? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Swami. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Swami. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you, Swami. Thank you. God bless thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Much. Thank you, Thank, you so much. Much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sukumar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Sukumar, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you.